Robinson, Judy, do you want to say a few words? Do you want to start? I you want me to start. You want to start? Start. Start. Let's start. I start. Okay. Okay. I'm gonna start. <laughs> what a day! What a day! Hello. The davening was anyway. The davening was anyway, as always, so so strong. And then we got word that uh, there's really heavy heavy fighting in Aza. Yeah. And and Shamayim opened up, and everybody was with their heart and soul singing, davening, davening, singing. Mamash, it was okay. Uh, we know so we know how um, how Reb Shlomo loved Eretz Israel and the people of Israel. Yes. And and he would go off and speak to them and sing with them and mechazek them. And there was nothing holier. To him. Well, everything was nothing holier to him and Shlomo. Right? <laughs> like everything was the holiest, but the holiest. but uh, just um, chayelei tzva ganal Yisrael b'shut amelit yosher mshamayim now Reb Shlomo lichonon ivracha. We should hear Yeshuot. Tremendous victories. From all fields, from all, all, all the borders, north, south, um, from all over, all the chayelim should come home safely. All those in captive should come home. The simchal l'chaim shalom to be hugged once again by their families. Bezat Hashem, all the wounded should be healed. Bezat Hashem, and uh, no more tragedies, no more korbanot. Enough. Daylit zalotenu. Hashem, we got the picture. We got the. We got the memo. We're doing what you asked us to do. We did. We're doing what Rev Shlomo taught us to do. Ahavat Yisrael. Just have love in your heart. Just see the good in people. Everything else is nonsense. It's just chitzoni stuff that doesn't really speak about our essence. And uh, and we're, we are we are here to celebrate the yurtzeit of this man that brought so much love into this world. Now, Tanani, I mean, I, I was asked to come to step in because Rev Levish is not here right now. He's sitting Shiva in Montreal for his late father, Alava Shalom. And so being the head of the women's program, Judy asked me, do you mind saying it, to come spe stepping in? Um, so I was thinking, okay, what am I going to say? How many already first-hand stories do I have? I, I, I didn't know him as you, as a lot of you did firsthand, but I do have my firsthand, so I'm not... I'm not that young that I don't have stories with Rav Shlomo. Uh, I'll, I'll share with you um, what it is that I can contribute by way of a personal experience. First of all, growing up in Montreal as a teenager, I remember him coming to do these concerts in the park to free Soviet jury and how important that was to rally up all the Jewish people to understand that our brothers and sisters in, in, behind the Iron Curtain need our tefillot. They must not be forgotten. They must do everything. Raising the awareness of Avat Yisrael. And just because we're living our lives in America, uh, we got to care. We, it ha has to matter to us how Jews are living or not allowed to live in other places in the world. And it should bother us to the point of going to demonstrate, making a lot of noise in the world, Right. You remember those rallies, right? And those demonstrations. Uh, that was a big part of my youth. But later on, when I became a teacher, now this is a story I'm going to share with you. It, it might sound like it's a story about me, but really it's all about Rav Shlomo. It's at, at a time where he was not, not even alive anymore. Okay. Um, <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> Um, so it's a time when he was not alive anymore. I, I did see him like as an adult also. We would, he would come to Montreal. People would take him out to a restaurant. We happened to be there. Uh, there would be the usual hugs between uh, him and my, uh, my husband of then and et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, you know, like he was a presence in Montreal, especially with the brats in Montreal also. So Shlomo was there, right? That's just because I couldn't live without Shlomo. Uh, more for more than six weeks. <laughs> there you so, go. So he used to call. You have no idea. One time you call me, you said, Rip, he's here. And so like, who's here? Rip Shlomo's here. <laughs> and like expecting me just to like leave my babies and like just whatever I was doing. I, I, I regret so much not coming to your home that time when you called me. But okay. Uh, 
add it to the list of regrets, but okay. But the story that I want to share with you is, is, is so exemplifies for me what Rev Shlomo uh, represents. And what he represents is, is all the teachings of the Hasidic masters, but not as just stories to tell, but to be lived, to internalize all the lessons and to be the example in life of what that looks like in real time, if you would take all those stories to heart and what kind of refinement and what kind of human being you could become if you actually listen to the stories and allow them to affect you and make that the agenda of your life and how you and and how your personality is going to develop. So this is that type of a story. So I was, it was the first day of, of school. Uh, I was a teacher in, uh, in Herzliya. I was a colleague of Rev Shlomo, of Sholem, Rev Sholem Zal. We were colleagues in the same high school. And um, it was the first day of, of classes. And I took, I, it's Herz, called Herzliya High School, day school in Montreal. I drove my daughters to their base Yaakov. And in enough time for me to come, to drive to my school, park the car and show up for first period. And um, before, before I tell you that, I have to, I have to do an, a little bit of an introduction. Why that day was very, very special. And then I'll tell you how Rev Shlomo fits into this. There was a class the year before that I taught at Herzliya, grade 10 Tanakh. The beginning of the year was absolutely disastrous, nightmarish. A new teacher, high school kids, not really interested in, in the Jewish studies. Like, you know, the science and the math is like more important. My parents are just making me come to this school, yada, yada. Okay, you know, this is cute, but we're not taking you seriously. I would go to Rav Shalom almost every day and cry my eyes out. I figured it out and they became my chevre at a certain point. They became my chevre. By the end of the year with this monstrous class, <laughs> they actually, without me knowing, they went to the um, to the principal and asked them, they wanted more of Mrs. Dworkin. They wanted Mrs. Dworkin to teach them also in the graduating year. But I wasn't the Tanakh teacher of, of grade 11. Grade 11 is a graduating year in Montreal. Um, someone else was, and they said, no, like we really want, we really want Mrs. Dworkin. They came up with a plan without even me knowing that I should teach them one period of cycle, cycle is 10 days, and I should they should have some sort of gathering, meeting with me, a learning with me once a cycle. And it could be anything I want to do. Any I can teach anything I want. It would be okay with them as long as they continue their relationship. So fast forward, this is the beginning of the new year. New year. I didn't know what I was going to do with them. I tell you the truth. I was busy all summer. I didn't really give it much thought. I kind of sort of knew what I wanted to do. But now the first day of school is, is happening. And I was going to meet them for the first time by their request with the administrator's uh, blessing to stick this extra period in the schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and I had, yeah, and I had no idea what I was going to teach them. And I'm like, as I'm driving my daughters to school, to base Jacob, dropping them off, and then I'm driving back to my high school, I'm I'm realizing I don't have a lesson plan. And I don't, I want, they asked for it. So I don't want to disappoint them. I don't want to disappoint them. It ha even the first class has to be chazat. It has to be with content that they're expecting from Mrs. Dworkin. That's why they asked uh, for this class. But I had no idea what to do. So the whole way I'm davening to Hashem, please allow me to not disappoint these children. Uh, send the words into my head. I'll give you full credit. You'll drop it into my head. It'll come out my mouth. Nothing to do with me. But I'm drawing a blank. But it was a time when we still had CDs in the car. Actually, not bad because I could have said cassettes because there was a time when we only had cassettes. But okay. And of course, Rav Shlomo is playing. I have Rav Shlomo playing the whole entire time. And he's playing, I think it was, I think it was Shabbos and Shemaim. And, and you know how he is with his mellow singing voice. And then he interjects speaking. And he just brings your heart along and opens up the heart. And at a certain point, he says somewhere, as I'm davening and crying to Hashem, I can't believe I don't have a lesson plan for these kids. What's going to be with me? I can't, you know, I just don't, I had such an achrayas that I'm carrying with me 
they asked for this and I have nothing. It's going to be like, oh, so what did you do in the summer? Okay. Everyone's going to go around. It's just going to be a waste of time. I do not want that type of a class. And um, and I'm I'm crying. I'm literally crying at this point. And I and Shlomo's in my head, like filling up my every bit of space in my head. And then I hear him saying from the CD, from the audio of the car, you know what the problem is these days? People are afraid to be the best that they can be. They hold back on being as good as they can be. Something like that. And that somehow, like, in, in all my, like, davening to Hashem in my head and all of the tears, I heard it. It resonated in my head. And I go and I try to, I, I find, I'm finally at the school and I'm about to park my car. But my parking spot, somebody else took it. It was very, it's always very close to the hydrant. So nobody else dares park there. But somebody that day dared park there. So I had to actually go around. And find another parking spot. So in this time, I'm going to say it to Judy because she's from Montreal. So I had to park not in front of the school, but next to Spanish and Portuguese on the yeah, side. Okay. Right. So I'm praying. So I found a spot, not too bad, a little bit of a whatever, two minute walk. But then I see somebody walking towards me. Some Foxman, if you're going to end up seeing this uh, recording, uh, <laughs> it's your schut. Okay. I see him with his daughters walking behind him. And he's walking down the sidewalk and it looks like he's walking towards my car. And they have their milk crates with their all of their first day of school supplies. Because that's what Beis Yaakov had them do. We had to bring milk crates with our supplies and make those into the cubbies. And they look pretty sad, these girls. And then I see, I'm, I'm, I'm parking the car and then Simcha Foxman, he knocks on my window and I, and I, I don't really know him. I didn't know his name even. But I recognize him as a parent of, for, of the same school I sent my girls to. I've seen him drop his girls. I've just recognized his face from around. So he's he's telling me um, it's the first day of school. I said, I know. I just I just dropped off my daughter. He says, Yeah, my like my car isn't working. My car's not working. It broke down. And I thought he was asking me if I could take the girls to school. I said, I just came from there and I have to teach. I'm, I teach her Herzliya. I'm, I'm going to miss. I'm going to, I can't be late for first period. I'm teaching first period. I have them, the, that class that I told you about, third period, the first period after recess. There's two periods, recess, and then the third period. And he's saying, no, I would, I would never ask you to drive. Oh, <laughs> no, but could I have your car keys? Could I, I'll drive them. Like, I would never ask you to drive. Can I have your car? <laughs> it's like, and, and I'm thinking, okay, I didn't expect that. But you know what? You're lucky. I'm telling Simcha because I just heard Shlomo telling me that the problem with this world is that people are afraid to be as good as they can be. And people should just allow themselves to be as good as they can be. So here's the car keys. <laughs> and just do me a favor. When you bring the car back, park it around here so I don't have to go looking where it is. And give the keys, go to the school and give the keys to Tsippy the secretary. Don't give it to any other secretary, just give it to Tsippy the secretary. Fine. <laughs> he said he'll do it. So I teach my first class. I teach my second class. I still don't know what I'm going to do after recess with my with my with my very special chevre that requested this class of me, right? Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> so now I taught my first period, I taught my second period. And I'm going to Tsippy the secretary. Tsippy, did anyone bring you car keys by any chance? She says, car keys? No. <laughs> okay. It only It's only a 15 minute drive like both ways. Like, this is like almost enough time definitely to bring the car back. I said, and then she remembers, oh, but somebody brought you a manila envelope, a big yellow office manila. And I'm thinking, manila envelope for keys? Oh, it's like, what happened to the car? It all fl got flattened. It's like it fit in the envelope. Now what's with the envelope? I open the envelope and here's Reb Shlomo. Okay? I open the envelope and I see the car keys. Thank God the car keys are there. But in the envelope is also um, a, a, a printout of the last interview from Life magazine that the interview of Shlomo before he died. It's Mamish, the last interview of Reb Shlomo before he died. And mm -hmm. on this interview, on this printed paper, there's a, a post-it from Reb Shlomo. 
Simcha. He says, and since you mentioned Rav Shlomo, he's one of my favorite all-time rabbis. And I thought you might enjoy this interview of him. So I scan the interview. I scan, I scan, I read it fast. And I'm saying, this is it. This is it. This is my class. This is what I've been davening for. <laughs> Shlomo, how did you do that? Hashem. Now, what was written in this article? He said there, when you meet non-Jews that hate Jews, okay, it's not nice, it's unpleasant, but you kind of get used to it. But when you meet Jews that don't know the first thing about Judaism, that's heartbreaking. And I'm thinking this is exactly what the kids wanted. This is what was missing in their Jewish education. Tell me why it's important. <laughs> and then I'm realizing, I'm thinking Hashem didn't answer me. First of all, Hashem answered me big time, but he was letting me live the drama. He was answering me in the drama of the story. I had to experience giving up something, my car, and not caring about it to help a fellow Jew. That's chesed. Amen. That's what Shlomo is all about. It's all a chesed. Like the yeah. answer that it came through, the tzaddik that Rav Shlomo was, it's like, it's not, it could have been any other way, right? It, it could have been any in any other ways that it could have, but not really. <clears throat> he, he, it's like the message was, you want to teach something special to these kids? Listen carefully to what Rav Shlomo is teaching. Listen carefully to what he's giving in this world. Because that's the essence of Geula. The unity, the Havat Yisrael, the Havat HaTorah, the Havat HaTzadikim, Talmidei Chachamim, the Hitkashrut, the connection that we have to all of them. And then not just leaving it as theoretical knowledge, but in practice, putting it into practice. Don't just talk chesed, live chesed. Some, you know, six, seven, eight-year-old girls wanting to get not be late for their first day of school should be more important to you to bring them joy in their heart than your car. Yeah. yeah. Ah, the best thing I have, I have, I have to tell. So I, I, I run to the photocopy machine, right? I'm printing out this article and I'm I'm rushing into the class now. I'm running into the house with all these papers and I'm telling him, you're not gonna you're not gonna believe what just happened to me. And I'm telling him the whole story wow. about the car. What a lesson. <laughs> but and I'm telling them like really seriously, I didn't know what to do with you guys. And I'm diving to Hashem and Reb Shlomo and this, that, and the other thing, and this there. And then we're gonna read this article together. And then they were like, wait a second. You gave him the car? <laughs> That's all they could think of. You gave him the car? The rest of the year, like, hey, Mrs. Dworkin, can I have your car keys? That was like the whole year. <laughs> can I have your car keys? Um, but 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 that's that's it. That's like that's I there's nothing more to say for me that that to live Torah in real time, to be inspired that by the tzaddikim. How many stories of tzaddikim did he tell? He he made us, he made all of them our best friends our mentors, but not for it to stay as just a nice story, but actually to be living examples of ourselves. And that is the key to Gula. This is how I understand Rav Shlomo. This is what I'm forever grateful to him for. And Be'ezrat Hashem, his legacy will live on and we'll keep yeah. doing it. Yeshiva Samchat Shlomo. Be'ezrat Hashem. Yes. To, to bring in the light of Torah that speaks to the heart, the soul, the mind, in practical ways, I invite all of you, the men to the yeshiva, to the men's program, the women's to the women's program. There's some co-ed events, whatever it is, join us because this is the journey of learning how to internalize Torah and manifest and naturalize in a life that we can just, all of us, transform into the, the Kedusha light-filled beings that we are meant to be. Bezat Hashem. Thank you so much. This the story that, that you just Thank told you. was what? Mamash, the example that, that Shlomo was living and and mm -hmm. giving over to us from the bottom of his heart, his soul, he was he was guiding us to to live this way. 
And um, yeah, I mean, personally, when I would think, oh gosh, Shlomo, I really, I really need to talk with you within five minutes, no matter where he was in the world, whether he was in, I mean, we were, let's say in Montreal or I, I was in Oregon, wherever, he would call, he would call, he would, he was, I don't know, in London, Paris, uh, Johannesburg, I don't know where, but he would call. He says, hi, sugar, this is the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> Did you want something? <laughs> At your service. <laughs> um, once I, I learned that, um, that a, a real Rebbe, a real Tzaddik, uh, will, will answer whatever you have in your heart, even if you don't know how to express it. Um, <clears throat> whatever he's talking about, or she is talking about, uh, your your answer is going to be coming from that person. Because be why? How can that be? Because that that tzaddik is is not reading your mind but reading your soul and and uh being with your soul and that's that's the answer you know when when you're with with um in that place where you're sharing your soul that's that's where that's where the communication needs to be. And I, I really, really hope that we've learned as much as possible. And I hope that uh, we're gonna continue learning from each other, with each other, uh, this, because this is this is the way to live in Mashiach's time. And this is what's happening right now. This is what we're fighting for, literally, and, and, and davening for. I just came back from uh, from the kever, from Har Menuchot, because it's uh, yeah, the day actually my neighbor was next to me, <laughs> neighboring mm -hmm. at the kever also David, and uh, and I'm sure that he could tell you, at least eighteen years of practically being with Shlomo, uh, being uh, his uh, his horn player. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and I know that he witnessed and and all of us have witnessed this kind of life of of communicating of not even communicating but being with each person's soul. I hope that uh, I hope that we'll succeed. Mm -hmm. All of us will succeed. I hope Mashiach is going to show us. I hope that Hashem is going to guide Mashiach to to um, to guide us to be in that kind of world. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. Uh, Thank you. I can invite Amuna. <laughs> You want to sing something? I can't. I can't. I can't sing. Who who wants to? Come, so come to in front of the camera. No, no. But we want to see you in the. Okay, I can just move it. Okay, we're opening space for you. And here's more shadow. We're already open. that could you tell a story? Would you mind? <laughs> Yes, if you want. Huh? If you want. You want to tell the story? Which, no. which story? Okay. Huh? Which story? No Moshe Rabbeinu story. Let's do a song and then we'll okay. watch the video. Okay. <laughs> we have Moshe Rabbeinu live. Mm -hmm. I know. His name is Moshe Rabbeinu. His name is Moshe Rabbeinu? Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I just want to say that I know that uh, Yitzhak and Tamar appears. Are going to be coming soon. That's what I understood. Good, nice. What I didn't. Hear. The Atiyas are going to come. Great. Yes, I. Yes, I, I invited I Jonathan. Jonathan. Thank you. And no, you want to speak Jonathan. after the song? Yeah, yeah, I said Yitzhak and Tamar. Okay. Oh, great. Okay. I don't know about the other. Okay. 
Also, uh, Moshe David is coming as well. Who? Moshe David. Hakohen. Any recommends? Uh, he's not really saying anything. He's thinking out loud. Trying to say any uh, suggestions for sizing. But, uh, We can't hear David. Uh, I don't know if he's muted or or what, but it's not transmitting sound to me. It's not close enough to the microphone. Really? Well. Nice try. The floor to Amuna, but she has a time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But anybody in the back, you can come closer, please. Please come closer. Please come closer. Please yeah, come closer. Batman here. Okay, let me just answer him. Yeah, you can start talking. It's okay. I'll I'll remove. It. Okay. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, I called him Judy and I said we have to do something for the yard side. Are we doing something Tuesday morning? But that's okay that it's Tuesday night because nobody wanted to go home anyway. We didn't want to go home. And um Wow, so this morning I did a few errands and then I said, Ruben, we've got to go to the camper. We just have to go. We have to go already. We have to go. I have to see the people that only come earlier in the day and then leave and we've, we've got to go right now. And uh, we got there and then people said, oh, there aren't so many people here. Where are all the people? I said, don't worry. By Mincha, by Mincha, there's going to be so many people. And and it really was true that if you got I've there, seen, I've never seen so many. Oh, there yeah. were, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I there were a lot. There were a lot. We got together during Corona, but that's nothing compared to getting together during a war. Because that's all we can do is be together. The only thing we can do is daven and connect and be together and do mitzvahs. And, um, well, so I always, I always had this one Torah that Shlomo gave over to me that um, before we came into the world, from the higher worlds, so we need everybody, you remember from last year, I tell it every year, we need everybody that we're going to meet, we're going to, we, we need everybody up in Alam before we come down to this world, we need everybody that we're going to meet our whole lifetime. How could we do that? I mean, like, 
And first of all, I mean, that takes a long time and you meet thousands and thousands of people. Like, how can you do that? But time up there is different. So it's, it's different. It's just a different kind of timing. So we meet everybody and then we come down and um, and then we re-meet everybody because we already met them. We already met them before. <laughs> and we re-meet everybody. And when you meet somebody and you say, wow, I met you before. So we really did. We really all met each other before. And look what Shlomo did. He mamish connected all of us. And every year, more and more people come and we meet more and more people. And um, wow, wow, wow. We should only hear Bissaro Tovot. We should only hear Bissaro Tovot. And um, everything that everybody is going through and people that, whatever, whatever we're going through, we have to, mom is just like Davin more and maybe even scream it out. And um, it's going to get to the Kisei HaKavod. God has no choice but to guard his people. He has no choice. He has, we're not giving him any choice. We mamish. So um, any mitzvah that anybody gives to you, just do it till the end. Don't just do it. Do it for simcha. And do it to the end. Do it to the end. Somebody needs directions. Mamish, practically take them there. Or if someone needs you to just help them, whatever it is, do it with your whole heart. Because we don't know what who we're saving. We don't know who we're saving or where it's going. And Shlomo would always say also that, I mean, this is a Torah that everybody knows, that we see somebody else's mistakes and we think, oh my God, I can't believe it. And then we realize, why are we seeing it? We are only seeing it, only seeing it because we have it in ourselves a little bit. If we just fix it, if we just fix a little bit of that mistake, maybe we don't have the whole mistake, just a little bit. If we fix it just a little bit, first of all, it's unbelievable what we're doing for our own neshamas because we, we, we saw something that we needed to fix and we didn't even realize it. But we're helping everybody in the whole world that needs to fix it. And, um, and we can't judge anybody for anything. You can go in the shuk and somebody's screaming their head off at somebody else. You think, what kind of person is this? Why are they screaming at somebody else? What do we know? They really wanted to hit them or kill them and they're only screaming at them. So we have no idea. We have no idea where each person is standing, what each person is challenged with. And we have no idea at all. And then our children, when we see them making mistakes. So listen, my granddaughter just got married. She decided no matter what, she's getting married. Yud Aleph, Yud Aleph from Keshvan for Rachel Imenu's Yurt site. Don't tell anybody. I know this is being broadcasted that she's not 18 yet. And there's really a law. But no, next week, next week. I think the law is 16. No, no, they changed it to 18. Changed you have to 18? be 18 because... Oh. Her, her mother, my daughter, got married when she was 17. I went to the Rabbanut, I signed. But now they made it, even if you sign for your daughter, they just got to be 18. But it's okay, it's only in like one week. Only one week. So don't tell, don't tell. Lovely. And um, <laughs> wow, wow, wow. So we mamish, we made this wedding and we didn't think anybody was going to be able to come. We didn't know who is here. I don't know who's here, but whoever's here, thank you, thank you. So we don't know who was going to come. They bought for a certain amount of people. But all the chayalim mamish got out. The chasin is a, was a chayal, is a chayal. And we, um, we didn't think anybody could get out, but everybody got out. And she had like 200 friends all over Israel. And you think anybody was afraid of traveling? They all came. Every single one of her friends came. They all was. She's the first one getting married in the class. And they all wanted her bracha. My tohar bracha el. She gives brachas. Wow, wow. So Shlomo said what we give over to our children is not just for, for right now. 
It's for all generations. It's mamish, like we give over Shabbos, whatever we're giving over, giving brachas. Shlomo taught us how to stop in Halel. I gave it over to my daughters. I every every era of Rosh Chodesh. Are you davening with your with my granddaughters, with my great granddaughters? We have to give it over so strong. We have to give it over so strong. And that that Avram Avinu is getting tested all the time. He's getting tested all the time. And it gives us, it gives us koach for every test that we get tested for. Avram Avinu is mamish helping us. He's mamish, he put it in the world. He's mamish put it in the world. He's like paving the way for all the tests we have to go through. And Shlomo would say that Avram Avinu and Sari Menu, they were not just davening for a baby. They were davening for their Yitzchak. Their mamish were davening for their Yitzchak. So I'm blessing the whole world who's ever davening for children. Mamish daven for mamish your baby, whoever it is, mamish for yours. So when children come into the world, they know that their parents, mamish daven for them, that their parents, mamish daven for them. And um, Yitzhak, they were laughing. Yitzhak is laughter. Sarah she couldn't believe it. But why is it that she was like a 25-year-old? Because she had been davening so strong, so strong. So that's another thing. That whatever we're davening for, we have to daven for it like stronger than we ever davened before. We have to daven so much that mamish, that all our boys that are on the front lines, they mamish do, that God is making miracles for every single one. And, um, you know, I never, I, I'm a pacifist. I never believed in war, killing people. Huh? Someone also was lovey, lovey, kiss everybody, hug everybody. But when it came to Mamish fighting, getting rid of evil in the world, that's what we, I never talked about this. I never said this to anybody, but this is what we have to do. We have to get rid of all the evil, not just for us, for the whole entire world. It's like God gave us this, this top key that we should be so head to manage get rid of evil. So we have to daven morning, noon, and night. Morning, noon, and night, manage. God should hear all our prayers. God should hear all our prayers okay. that all our children should be safe wherever they are. And um, the things that what's going on in Eretz Israel is lo yuman, all the chayalim wearing sitzes and making Mamish davening and mamish like before they go out, mamish, everyone saying Shema together and everybody in all of Israel is davening for this chayal, that chayal, that one that was kidnapped, mamish everywhere, just like everybody is connecting and it doesn't matter what this Jew does or what that Jew does, everybody is mamish, we're one family, we're just one family, we're one family, so um. Wow. Yeah. And um, I put together a call, Hebra, but I can't even mail it to America because nobody's even flying, but never mind. So it's not that I was going to use this for doing PR, but before, I'm telling you, before we, it was, we put it together before a war even started, and the theme was manifesting Gula, manifesting Gula. So that's what we all have to do, and um, so you can find it on Amazon. On Amazon, Kohera 2023, Manifesting Google, whatever, you'll find it. You'll find it. And, um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I didn't, I don't even know how to check those things. Okay. Wow. So I, um, wow. What, what else should I tell you? Um, yeah, just even little things, just even little, little things that when we see somebody, when we see somebody, oh, so this is this is a quote from Shlomo. I'm going to give you this quote. He said that, um, yeah, when, when you're loving another person and you meet them, wherever you are in the world, when you're loving somebody and you meet them, you're already in Yerushalayim. And when two people meet, 
And not only do they love each other, but they remember there's a God in the world who's bringing them together. They know that there's a God in the world. He said, you're already in the base of the pastor. Mm -hmm. And then he says, when you're kissing your children, when you're kissing your children, you're already in the Kodesh Kodesh. Mm -hmm. And um, someone always says, when they ask, where is, where is Sarah? She's already in the Kodesh Kodesh. Mm -hmm. Sarah, she's already there. She's already there. And um, well, when we take care of our children in the middle of the night, someone would say, you're like the Kohen Godol going into the Kodesh Kedoshim. So for the Imas, the Saftas, just when we meet each other, when we meet each other, say good things to each other. Say good things to each other. And um, okay, the last thing I'll tell you, because I'm sure everyone wants to say something. We have to be thanking each other all the time. So I just want you to know that um, I married somebody. I, I married somebody who was never married before. I was 54 and he was 70. And everybody thought that I was totally crazy. I have 14 children. I married somebody that never was married before. So all I had to tell them was, you've been waiting for me for 30 years. And then they were quiet, okay. And then he <laughs> said that someone taught him that when you get married, all you do, have to do, and it's going to work, is tell your wife she's right. That's yeah. all. That's, That's all. My father always said. Just tell your wife that she's right. Mm -hmm. And he said, the guy that told him, he my didn't father. do it, and he didn't keep it together. But my so we, we're together because he does it. He does it. So I want to just bless all the husbands. Tell your wife that that she's right. But that all the wives and moms should also compliment their husbands and just thank them. Just thank them all the time. Because whatever they're thank doing, you. whatever they're doing, they'll keep doing it also if you thank them. So um, and I thank you all for whoever's here and whoever's listening and to share all of this and um yeah thank you so much and judy good thing i called you so yeah i'm sure you would have done it anyway if i hadn't called you but, but it was the last night, but <laughs> i i oh yeah i thought that it was almost going to be last night but when i called you two days ago i said you have to do something aren't you getting together so you did it you did it and so thank you thank all of you and um a good yantif, a good yantif, a good yantif. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Uh, Another song? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to just tell you guys that the cost of this okay. are 80 shekels, but 70 for the your site. Nothing for the your site. And um, so I'm going to leave a passage and I'm going to go home. I'll give you a whole passage. Nothing first. Are you ready with your guitar? Mm -hmm. Um, I don't see you. I need you to unmute yourself and show yourself. Mm. That's on first. That's on first. That's... Okay, no, but he... Okay. So, someone offered to, to sing, but okay, he's not ready and I don't see him now, so... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Look, same problem as before. Well, they don't know that we can't hear him. Okay. 
Okay, that okay now. Okay, so could you make this big? I think the, it, the microphone was put. <sighs> Hello, can you hear me? Very well now. Okay, so you ready? Absolutely. But somebody else is playing guitar. I don't know. Who's on? Who's on first? Judy? I can't hear it. How can I, how can I make this big? Who did you? How do I go into the chat? I don't know. I've never used Zoom on a phone. I don't know how. Yes. <laughs> That's a big bundle. Yeah. You didn't bring them here. Huh? I walked by gave them to you in the other room. This is such a screwy thing. This guy's playing. Nobody can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you very well. Okay, so can I play? <laughs> I think you should just go ahead and play. I don't know what's okay. going to happen. Okay, because we have two people playing at the same time. Okay, you ready? No. But he's he's playing guitar and singing. I know, but who can hear him? Nobody. I can't hear him. So can I'll play. Can someone write up a sign and stick it on, on the screen right in front of his face? Okay. All right, right, bro. Okay, Don't so I'm going to play. I, I, I'm going to play, Okay. Maybe he'll this hear is, you. This is a combination of Bob Marley. The first part is Bob Marley, and the second part is Shlomo Karla Bakhzi Ghan Ali Bracha. Here we go. All right. You're running and you're running and you're running away. You're running and you're running and you're running, and you're running, and you're running away. Oh, 
Yes, I missed you. Came back here, Shabbat Lech Lecha. Living with the Parsha. Anyway. Okay. Okay, so some Kahak Bam here. Eighteen of Kabal Gabo, Yeshiva Simcha Shlomo, twenty ninth yard side of Rav Shlomo. And one hand, what could I say that hasn't been said already? And we've been gathering. And Everyone, especially a lot of Chaber here, so many personal interactions and so had the privilege to be with Rav Shlomo. But a little bit last night, I was thinking, even though we all know the story, but it's a good story to reveal in this period of time. And I was picturing Rav Shlomo in the next world a little bit. What maybe he's doing right now. So this is the story. Everyone knows the great Sadiq, Rav Moshe Lev of Sasev. Giant of giants. And when this time came, everyone has to leave the world. And don't ask me exactly how we know it, but one way or the other, before your soul goes up to heaven, your soul stops a little bit in Gehenna. He has a little taste of what's going on in him. So the great emotional life starts, if you can imagine. Uh, when you go to a ball game, you have different parts of the stadium you sit in. And so too in heaven, there are different sections. And you have your Baal Shem Tov and disciples. Shem Tov, the Gamach and Ephraim, told that Yaakov Yosef mentioned the Magid section. You have your Rehiva Ega section and all the great Mitzvah Shurabanim and Rashi Shiva, that wrote beautiful works. You have your sections of Gomle Chasadim. And when Moshe Leib Sasev is ready to leave the world, the whole contingency of the Baal Shem Tov and the whole Shashelet and the whole Chain of great, great lineage is all there. And Moshe Leib Sasev, though, before he's going up to heaven, he stops for a few minutes in Gehenna. And then in Gehenna, he hears and he sees everything that's going on in him. And he sees a lot of tortured, tormented souls. And we all understand that Gehenna for a reason, but at the same time, still, he's seeing suffering, he's hearing cries. Moshe Lev Sasev says, stop. I'm not going up. I'm not continuing my journey up to Canada. They say, listen, you know, very nice. He says, no, no, this is like a real protest. I'm, <laughs> this is, I'm staging a, a sit-in. And I'm, I'm not going up to my place in Canada so long that my brothers and sisters are suffering in hell. They say, come on, Moshe Lev Sasev. You know, Allah said, before you said it, we showed them Canada. They all went up to their place. And it's hot enough running hell. There's a lot of complaining. People say it's too hot, the weather. Other people are complaining, you know, and there's a whole traffic jam. Hey, Moshe David. And there's a whole thing going on in Gehenna. And we have all these people causing traffic who have to go up to Ghana. So you may you may do a little protest. Moshe Sasev says, tell Bezdin Shamala, I will not go up to Ghana. So long that my brothers and sisters suffering here in hell. So there, they bring the Bezdin Shamata, Shamala down to Gehenna. They say, Moshe Lev Sasev, this is a pretty big request. They ask to empty out hell and to bring the souls out from Gehenna to Gehenna. Moshe Lev Sasev says, they bring the divine court down. And they say, Moshe Lev Sasev, what do you have to say? This is what he says. Master of the world, master of the world. If you're the true Avraham, and he is the true merciful one. If you're the one who hears the cries, if you're the real Shomayat Fila, then how could you, how could you expect me to enjoy Ben Aden and bask in paradise when my brothers and sisters are suffering in hell? And unless I take all my brothers with me, I'm not going up to my place in Ghana. So they say, okay, let's see how real you are. And there's different versions of some would say the story. Both are equally nice. One is they check the number of favors that Moshe Lev Sasev did in his lifetime. Correspond to the exact number of souls that were that time in Ghana. 
Well, anytime they ask, someone asks them for a favor, ask them for something good, ask them for some help, he never said no. person who always said yes and was always there for Am Yisrael, you're the one to take souls out from Gehenna to Gan Eden. This is our Moshe Leif Sasa. Cleaned out Gehenna, unfortunately, we all know, filled up pretty relatively short, shortly after, but still, still, still. I'm just thinking a little bit, you know, about, I know, Everyone has their own different views on things, but I think one thing we all agree on is so much, so much pain these last few weeks. So many orphans and so many widows and so many wounded. So many people don't really know the whereabouts of the beloved. Just knowing that someone's in captivity doesn't give you closure. You know, where, what, what conditions are they in? What's going on? And here, one way or the other, I can see Shlomo knocking in heaven's doors. I'm telling the Bezin Shamala, I'm not going back. Normally the yard site, the soul ascends and goes higher and higher and higher. Goes to a deeper heichal, a deeper heichal, another heichal, another. And you go deeper and deeper, connected higher and higher to the Kisya Kavod. How could I go up to Gan Eden? My brothers and sisters, unfortunately, are suffering so much here down below. Anytime you do a favor, Shama said, for, one, for each other, you're taking someone out from Gehenim to Gan Eden. Elevating their soul from hell to, and bringing them up from hell to heaven. Right now, right now, we have to tear in the gates of heaven. Just today, this, in the morning, there was two more chayalim that were killed. Baruch Hashem, we also were able to lash out at the terrorist and every Jewish life, every Jewish mother has to bury a child, every Jewish father, any parent has to bury their child. So this is why we're still crying. We're telling Hashem as the world, we don't want to go up to Agan Eden. Till every, I'm just every Jew in the south, every Jew that was relocated in the north, everyone has a little Gan Eden restored to them. And together, we'll go and we can enjoy a little Gan Eden. Sure. Anyway, so this is a little bit of Oda. I think of these days. Just a little bit try to picture, you know, this. Again, I know everything I say, you know, I'm just saying it, you know, to bring it out in, in this period of time. And I'm not here to be machades anything or some, you know, but everyone knows Moshe Rabbeinu's whole becoming a leader. Why God chose Moshe. And Rashi says, Moshe Rabbeinu was no save no time or all He was able to feel the pain of his fellow Jew is able to feel the pain of his brother, able to feel the pain of Am Yisrael. So easy to just continue your life. I'm living in Paro's palace. I'm slated to be the next in command. I could be the continuation of here. Bayayish mitri make ishivri. mitri How could I see another Jew? Being whipped and beaten. I have to be no save and no time, but all in to feel my brother's pain. And when you feel that pain, Hashem says, Ah, you're the one. You left your comfort zone. I'll leave my comfort zone to reveal myself to you at Mount Sinai. You left your little comfort zone at the palace of Pharaoh and you went out. I was just thinking about Abba Mabinu. There could have been two reactions this Shabbos. God says, I'm going to destroy Saddam. So if I was Avam Avinu, but I said, you losers, I've been telling you the whole time. Why didn't you listen to me, Lot? I took you at Eretz Yisrael. I, you came with me, you were blessed with a great name. You were blessed with a reputation, you were blessed with money, financial prosperity. What were you missing? You, you saw Kulo Mashke, you saw something on the other side of, uh, of the, and you were drawn to it and you were pulled to it to such a degree. You brought this all upon yourself. Magia Lecha, this is, and next time, you can catch that I gave you a warning. It's even on YouTube. Rabbi gave warning about the uh, imminent attack. He had prophecy. And, and he knew about it. And, you know, you should have listened to me. Too bad you didn't enroll in my yeshiva. You could have saved yourself. And too bad you checked out early for my yeshiva. But we all know when Lot was taken captive. Ram Avinu didn't make Telem conventions. He didn't make commissions studying the source of the war of the four kings and the five kings. And why Kedilah Omer was taxing like this? 
And why? No taxation, no representation. And we're going to make a, none of that. He didn't go to the UN to protest. He didn't make a political committee. What did Avraham Avinu do? He took his 318 top pupils and he went out in the middle of the night. Chanicha was also a sword, by the way. And he went out in the middle of the night. And there he went and he liberated his nephew Lot. When you really, you know, so you'll say, Abba, I thought Avraham was a man of chesed. I thought he's a man of just, you know, maybe he should have made an open tent and invited the four kings in and had a dialogue with them and interfaith. And but, but you do great, but I had an interfaith discussion with the four kings and the five kings and make a whole little, you know, but no, when the Jews in trouble, he took out his sword and he went to battle and he freed his nephew. Sadiqim will say, because this was the God of Abraham Abinu. When the Jews in trouble, when my family members in trouble, I can't continue. But Avram could very easily say, Baruch Hashem now, a little evil has been removed from the world. Now I could, you know, maybe God will come back and appear to me. They say when Lot was with Avram, he didn't get such a clear revelation. But the very, very second Avram did what he did, the Pasuk says, After this matter, after which matter? After Avram went and fought the four kings. And the Kedush Levi says, Pelibad Dishiva says, after Avram used the Midav Gvura, he was able then to go and get this high revelation of Aspaklaya Meira, like a clear, clear revelation of godliness. And the whole covenant took place. Rosh Hashanah always talked about Noach didn't get a covenant of God, really. The world got a covenant, they won't destroy it again. But an intimate covenant of that, I'll be with you, that only happened after what? After Avram Avinu and this whole story of Lot. And the whole Ritben Abtar and the covenant being promised land and children and the whole futuristic thing only happened after Avram. Start with the Midah of what? The Midah of Gura. You know, sometimes you are what you want. But sometimes the big question is, are you willing to change yourself to what God really needs you to do? Are you willing to become water to dry land, dry land to water? Transform yourself. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you gotta, these are the days, you can have a certain Midah, you can have a certain attribute, a certain natural teva, but a real year Hashem is, I go against my teva to do the will of God. I'm willing to go against my own what? My own nature. My own natural, even perception of God. Just let's take it in a different way. A lot of us, let's just say, we have a natural tendency for compassion and human uh, and mercy. All of Am Yisrael has three basic attributes and traits. Rachmanim, Bashanim, Gomei Chasanim. And it's intrinsic inside each and every one of us, all students of Abraham Avinu. Magen Abraham, every person has this deep, deep Abraham Avinu inside of them. But then there are moments in life where Hashem says, now I want you to do the opposite of what you thought. Mm. Now, a lot of times I have the way God appears, let's take it between even people. I have different levels of context. I I know really tens of thousands of people. But I have different friends. People are Hebron friends. Other people are Harabayit friends. Other people are Rav Shlomo Hebron friends. Other people are work, work colleagues. Other people are friends because I happen to live in the same building and you need milk. Uh, the friends are commu- you know, because of circumstances. But the more you reveal yourself to someone and the more you open up to a person, the more you want to Understand who that person is, he or she is. God reveals himself to you. That person then will open up to you in a much more expansive way. So if my whole thing, let's just say someone says, I'm a yeshiva, I make, I'm a Gemara guy. I, I learn Gemara, I learn Shulchan Aruch, I'm the Nigla. And so the revelation of Elokus that you get is based on that aspect of godliness that you perceive. But if you expand your horizons, you expand yourself. I'm no longer just a particular lane and conduit, but now I am something bigger. And I'm now going out of my normal borders. I'm expanding myself and I'm learning new svarim and I'm learning, meeting new people. And I'm not afraid of change and I'm expanding myself. Then I've become a vessel to receive a higher level of the court of godliness. The Hashem is ready to reveal himself to me and a much, much more expensive, expensive way. So Baruch Hashem, everyone has their own little way. They came to Rav Shlomo from, 
from, from within, out, out within. But I always, always credit Rav Shlomo for just Mamish expanding my soul, expanding my mind, expanding my neshama, and then allowing me to receive new levels of God of revelation and levels of Alakut and just introducing me to a whole world. I always, I shared in the past that, you know, when you go to regular Shiva day school, the first thing the Rebbe, the rabbi says, when you start the, the you start the period, they start the class, is open up to parak so-and-so, pasuk so-and-so, point to the place, chapter and verse, five lines on the top, we add the two dots, we add the 10 lines down from the bottom, 10 lines on the top. And then all of a sudden, Rosh Lomo says, open your heart. Mm-hmm. Open your heart. Not open to this page. Not. Open your heart. This is a learning. Open your hearts. Open your hearts. So the more we open our hearts, the more we expand our hearts. The more we expand our hearts to other people, the more we expand our hearts to all of our Yisrael. Those who have bigger vessels and a bigger circle can expand their hearts to the whole world. And those who can have even more and more are able. And there Hashem reveals himself to you even in a more expensive way, in a bigger way. Right? And this is the whole story of Avram Avinu and Moshe Rabbeinu. When did God reveal himself to Moshe and this now? When did God reveal himself to Moshe and Mansai? Only when he felt the pain. And so too with Avram Avinu. So this is just a little bit. We'll do one nigan and then maybe one thing I want to read some words from Rav Shlomo himself. And I, it's good today to be by the Kema for quite a few hours. And I think my this made my Kippur look short. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, you know, generally in Yom Kippur you can do it for like an hour, and, you know, an hour and fifteen, an hour and a half because you're rushing. Through, you know. I think today we broke two hours easy. <laughs> and and um, so Bezat Hashem, let's do one nigan David if possible. Our Chaman is Zakenu. I'm <laughs> 
Officially, he's talking about some other tzaddik. Really, he's talking about himself. <laughs> and, and he's really describing himself, even if at that moment he wasn't consciously. Let's just hear these words. This is Mamash Khidr speak. Parsha. Can we um, move in so that uh, more people can have a group? Uh, and you can unstack the stools. Oh, there's more stools here. Yeah, there's chairs right here. Also. There's chairs. You need more? Ladies, you can come to the, this is the ladies section, men's section. How do you know that? Uh, yeah, no, don't start, don't start with me right now. Just that once you be comfortable. Come in, come in. Shift in a little bit. Okay, so these are the words of Shlomo. And again, many, many, if you apply this to many of the stories, but I'm just reading. You know, there are two kinds of Rebbe's, two kinds of holy people. The kind of Tzadik who spends most of his time in the Beit Midrash, learning and teaching the Holy Torah. He wears a clean black kapata and a big garter. Pairs are down to his shoulders and has a long beard. Only talks to his students and other tzaddikim, other rabbis. To those many people who come to him for help. When he goes out on the street, his eyes are half closed. He's afraid he might see something forbidden, so he doesn't look at anything or anyone. Two of his students have to lead him around. When people see him with his downcast eyes and his sugaba, they nod and say gabal to see holy. That's just how tzaddik should look. Then there's another kind of holy man. He's always late for davening. He sits and learns and teaches his students. That's the only part of the day. What's he doing the rest of the time? He's out on the streets looking for people's help. Stops by a poor man, but he doesn't just give him money. He talks to the schlepper for him. Maybe even holds his hand. He sees children crying and stops to ask what's wrong. A little boy is lost, so he takes the child home. Tries to fix things between a little girl and her parents, between a husband and wife. But maybe his clothes aren't always neatly pressed, and his shoes are maybe a little bit scuffed. But he doesn't have time to worry about things like that. Only worries about taking care of him. Only worries about taking care of other human. When people see him talking to a beggar, they shake their heads. He can't really be holy. He hangs around such people. Then look at his clothes. How can a tzaddik are in public looking like that? You see what it is? The first kind of rebbe. So busy guarding his purity that he walks with his eyes closed. He passes people, but he passes by people without noticing them, mm -hmm. which means he's blind to their pain. So maybe on the outside he's holy, but inside. The second kind of tzaddik, second kind of rabbi, one who runs around helping every year. For him, it's just the opposite. Maybe his outside looks a little bit unkempt, a little bit coarse, but his insides, ah, his insides are shining. His insides are shining. 
The truth is learning Torah and protecting our own holiness. The very high ways of serving God. In addition, we also got out of a way to help our brothers and sisters to love all of our Yisrael. And our service is so precious before the Master of Allah. Noach versus Abraham. Shlomo versus other Sadiqim. This is really the Torah. Not just sing his songs, but we should ramish, live his Torahs, and really walk in his ways, and really emulate all the beautiful, beautiful holy qualities and attributes. And no one, everyone has to be themselves, but let's have a little bachina of Shlomo's infiniteness, of his greatness, of his beyondness, of his depth of depth. Mamish eyes that could see and penetrate and just wipe out all the outside external shells in every person and cut right through and see Mashiach eyes. After by the Manachai Moshe David wrote, eyes to see, even the lowest places to see sparks of Mashiach, even in the most caucus things. A lot of us today all focus on the beatings. Everyone could quote how many people were kidnapped, went up, 1400. But we need also eyes to see the light after the beating, the light at the end of that tunnel, the light after the beating, the storage of Rebbe Melech and the Chosa, and it's not time to go into the big depths. One tzaddik, so much like, you better get out of the way. If you don't pay the parts of money, you're know, going to beat the living daylights out of him. So he basically, told, he saw from the letter that the parts wrote, he owes the rent, that he's in trouble if he doesn't pay. But then he went to the great Rebbe Melech, and the Melech said, don't, don't, not only don't pay the debt, the debt that you owe, but don't let the parts off unless he gives you 10,000 rubles. And he initially thought that the, he's crazy, Rebbe Melech. What type of advice is that? To demand 10,000 rubles. From, I owe the guy. And again, it's not time for the long, long story of it. At the end, of course, the pirates had to come as Moshe for forgiveness. And eventually he got 10,000 rubles. And he invested and became the richest person. Once Sadiq could see, and you hear all the YouTube, everyone knew what was going to happen. Everyone knew, and they had prophecy, and they knew, and they had a Hilo, and the Shem Abai wasn't shining properly that day. So you have them all Monday morning quarterbacks. Uh, maybe uh, this prime minister should have known, and maybe this uh, defense minister should. Everyone is, everyone has fingers to point. But our eyes have to be, in my humble opinion, okay? God knows who to blame, whose fault it is. But we have to see the great light, the Ochadash. Mm -hmm. After all this, and after the Makkah we took, it's going to be a new light, a Machadash, a new light shining, a light like never before. Mm -hmm. And I'm Yisrael and Eretz Yisrael like never before. Mm -hmm. And we'll be able to create something. Mamish in the world. A lot of people get stuck, myself included, all the darkness. But really, really, we hear the Ruach Elohim, the spirit of Mashiach hovering over the waters. The spirit of Mashiach hovering in this whole, whole confusing, confusing time and era. Bezat Hashem, Ayom Elohim Yor, the mess of the world, so let there be light. But God, the Son of says, is telling us, Ayomer, when a Jew sees a lot of Tovo, Choshech and Tom in his life, what does he have to say? Elohim, Master of the world, the earth, let there be light, shine your light. Show me where your light is hidden in all this chaos, in this Tovo, Choshech and Tom. Ah, you're asking the question, Mi Balabira. Hates this Allah Balabira. You're asking who's the one in charge of this whole capital, who's running this whole show. Seems like chaos. It seems like everything's going to, to the doors. The whole world is destroyed. Everything is going down. You ask the question. You scream out, "Mi balabira?" He sits Allah balabira. Anyway, guys, if you don't have Evan Shlomo, if you don't have Moshe, these 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 are Torahs. These are Mashiach Torahs. These are not just nice vartlach. These are not just nice, you know, nuances. And it has a vav. It's written. These are the Torahs of Shlomo. A Torahs of the Eitzachayim. These are Torahs of Gula. The Torahs that really can give us the strength and ammunition. To hold out to the great, great day and to bring the great day, Bezat Hashem. Amen, amen. It's not enough to believe in Mashiach. We have to believe we can bring him. And we have the great ability to hasten that great, great day. Amen, amen. Amen. I just want to, for a second, without the guitar, just to start. Lord, 
And I was thinking about, you know, his chesed, and he, you mentioned the Kavura. And I was just thinking, it, it, it resonated with me. I'm more, I'm more inclined towards the Kavura. And I said, at the time, we need Kavura. But when the, just the just idea came to me that we can see where the world's trending towards us, that this, it looks like there's going to be great pressures on us, a lot of Kavura against us. And it's possible that when we're overwhelmed with all the Kavura, um, we'll find the solution just shining out chesed. That's just the idea that came to you. Know, you know, again, I'm not on the level of the Torah. I just tell it to somebody to say. It's a famous, famous but People, it's better they don't just have to look at me. But at the same time, it's a beautiful teaching which someone would teach. Again, generally, I only quote Torahs that I'm living. And Halavai should be on the level to live this Torah also. God tells Abraham, Now, if you look at this, you want to be synonymous in the Pasuk, in the verse, 
She said, those who bless you will be blessed. And then there would be synonymous one another. Those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you will be cursed. So the word aor has a double connotation. A lot of words in Hebrew could have within it. It has the shoresh, of course, of aror, of the curse. It also has the shoresh of aleph of resh, of light. It was like a crazy, crazy way. That we we're just explaining what she said so beautifully. Those who bless you will be blessed. Those who curse you. There's two levels of nakama. It's a level of nakama. I wipe out my enemy. I flatten them. And Mamish teaches them you never touch a Jew. You never got, you'll never ever have a havamina to hurt one of God's children. And they have to learn never again in the harshest way. Then there's another never again. Out of Rebbe Meir, out of Nero, the Roman general came out to great Rebbe Meir. Out of the Buzarad and the Babylonian murder, chief assassin of the Babylonians came out Shmaya Naftali. Me tain tar mitame, says in Eo, the Tafasa, who could make out for something so pure? Me tain tar mitame, for something so unholy, how could something so pure come out? So sometimes there's a higher level in the coming. Someone would quote this term from Label Le- 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 Ega that you could have the B'nai Ban of Shalhaman learning Torah and B'nai So everyone says the story ended that I, we hung them. We hung those anti Semites and I knocked them off. But then there's even a higher level in the coming. That B'nai Ban of whatever it means, the recreant or the descendants or a, disciples of that school of thought of Amman. Uh, I don't want to get technical, but the concept is that descendants. Of that base medrash of Haman, of hate and murder, and killing and annihilating the Jews, end up becoming great disciples in the neighbor. That learned Torah. So a little bit sometimes from Gvura to Chesed, Chesed to Gvura. Sometimes you have to know how to lead with the right, Chesed, follow with the left. Sometimes in boxing, you lead with the left, follow with the right. Always, it's always a balance of the two together. Mezat Hashem. We learn the balance and have a beautiful compared and harmony in our lives. Mm-hmm. Okay, I don't want to hog the show. A lot of people I'm sure have like to say. Okay. And, uh, um, thank, you. thank you. Can I see a show of hands here? Who wants to share? Are you going to share something? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to have Moshe David and then we're going to invite uh, Sheva Chaya who's online. She wants to share a few words. So come. Maybe Sheva Chaya first. You want Sheva Chaya? Yeah. Uh, ladies first? No. Okay, let's do ladies first. Okay, Shabachaya, can you unmute yourself and uh, and uh, and let's see your face so I can pin you and you can hear you. Shabachaya, can you hear me? I can hear you, but are you are you not showing your face? My face is showing. Okay, so let me find you. Oh, there you are. Okay, good. So I'll just pin you. Add pin. Pin. There you go. And I'll put the speaker. Okay, good. Very good. So uh, you can start and uh, share. Okay. So, um, hi everyone. So I I wanted I picked out just a little little piece of something um from Shlomo that we've probably all heard, um, but it's really resonating specifically right now for me. And um, for Barab Shlomo, the the effect of you know tapping into the times is like on a on a on a real level. So for me, this is this is fitting. Um, he he says he says, how is it that we're able to wait two thousand years for Yerushalayim to be rebuilt? Because my connection to Yerushalayim comes from such a high place, I could wait forever. I'm not going to sit and wait for a bagel for two hours. It's not worth it. Why? Because life is more important. How long will you sit and wait for a friend? You'll sit as long as they're important to you. Some friends are two hours important to you and others are three hours. And others even important five hours. But I'm not going to sit for three, I'm not going to sit for three days. Can you imagine waiting for somebody for 2000 years? It must be very important. Life itself is very important, life itself. We always think of life in terms of what can I do with it? Because for us, life is money and money has no real value, only what you can do with it. For $1, I can buy a Coca-Cola and an ice cream. For $5, I I can have blintzes. Life itself is not what you're doing with it. Life is life itself. 
Eretz Yisrael is the land of life. Yerushalayim is the city of life. For life itself, you wait forever. You miss it, you pray for it, you long for it, but you wait for it. If you're connected to life, then there's no reason to get angry. Why should I get angry? Nothing is that important to take away my life because when I'm angry, I'm dead. I'm interested in living. I'm interested in Yerushalayim. I, I have it, but I want it. I'm alive, but I long to live. So when I read this a little bit earlier, um, this level of waiting forever for something and, and you know, what really matters and life matters. So really making me think of, of the, of the captives of the hostages in this, in this moment. And I thought it was a real opportunity. I know a lot of people want to speak and we don't want it to get too late, but I think even to take one minute and, you know, tap in, tap in, in our hearts and, and in our minds to, um, to all of the hostages now and, and to, and to send them so much light and send them so much love and, and knowing that, that we're waiting for them, that we're not, we're not forgetting for one second that, uh, about them and, and we're praying for them. And each one of them is like our best friend and our, and our child and our parents and our, and our siblings and, and 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 they're us they they matter and this deep level of of uh caring so much about life is so so the the spirit and and feeling of, of Shlomo. so uh, i just wanted to put that out there that that we we send out really really strong from our hearts and our minds um this message to to all of our dear brothers and sisters that are that are being held captive that, that we're waiting for them and we want them home and, and every second counts and we can't stop thinking about them. And, uh, and also obviously for the soldiers, every single one of them, not, not, a, not a hair on the head of one should, should be hurt. And, and we're waiting, we're waiting and, and, and we're together. And uh, we, should go, we should go from strength to strength with this love, with the, the unity of, of who we really are, knowing, knowing that life really matters. Which we learned so deeply from Shlomo and 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 um, from from being a part of this chevre. So that's what I want to share. So much love, and we should hear good news. Amen. Thank you. That was beautiful, Shavachaya. So beautiful. Okay. <laughs>
So with so much that is unknown, I think one thing is clear, that we're in a moment right now, in a profound moment, changes. It's uh, when you're in the moment, it's it's really difficult to even understand or comprehend or try to grasp, but maybe we shouldn't. Um, but there's moments that things change. And uh, um, just as we start, I think one other thing is clear, I hope to everyone, that anyone who now has the schut to be in a place of light should be there and be sharing whatever simpen light we have to all those who are not, all those who are, we're all brokenhearted, of course, everyone here, but we also have the schut to be in a space of light and to share that as much as we can. When we talk about the balance of chesed and gvura, like we heard before, there's mm -hmm. other crazy balances. To be able to be besimcha of the redemption over one soul and to see Am Yisrael rejoice in that moment and at the same time to keep our heart broken over the rest. And it's it's an amazing thing to be able to do that because it's one, it's one heart. Mm -hmm. And it can be one heart at the same time, which is broken and which is whole. And whatever moments of that we can be in the in, within the light, to do so because there's so much, so many people out there that that need it. Um, the the day after Simchat Torah, there was a planned chatuna of a friend of ours, who's um, and you know the wedding hall was cancelled, of course, and everything, but he has no parents. So uh, we just got together in Tukar and had the Khatuna. And to be able to gather yourself together like that, the Simcha for, you know, is, is really the that that and it's not so easy, right? But it's so important to be able to be in the moment of Simcha at when you should be. And you shouldn't feel bad about that because we're all broken at the same time. And to be able to balance and hold. Both of those, I think, is was the story of Shlomo's life. Came in, into a broken world. Judy, you know much better than me. Um, you no, know, my parents got married in 1943 in Budapest. Wow. So, yes. Wow. We know, we know uh, these the stories. I was overwhelmingly emotional to look at how many how many Hayalim and Hayalot got married just these couple of days. It's, it was it, it was overwhelming to see that that the doors opened for them and, and in their uniform, in their wherever, you know, with their gun and this and that, they got married. Wow. And and everybody was celebrating them. What what Nishamas? <laughs> what schools do uh, we have to be, to be living in this time? 
and uh, and, and and witnessing what you know these these moments of truth and and peace and loving and kindness we just have to keep on bringing it down hashem is asking us to do it and <clears throat> where we have to really in, in, in that sense i mean this this feeling that we have now is almost a relief in the beautiful sense of this is the amisal we knew we were all just we don't even remember where we were all in terms of the depression of how Am Yisrael could reach such a place of of, of mechloket. And it was just not so long ago. And then you see the amazing sense of everything that is being done. I don't know one person who's not doing something right now, who's not doing everything that they can for Am Yisrael. Um, um, and that's the feeling that you have. Um, but going back to the shift, um, after the Shoah, Rabbi Shlomo realized the world will never be the same. And something has to change. And he describes how he went to every single Rosh Hashiva in America, knocking on his door, saying, the world has changed. Where are you? Don't go back to the old world. And he said, I felt alone. I was left alone. And I realized, if not me, there would be no one understanding this. So in that sense, Sometimes you have a shift in which things have to change. And Rav Shlomo was, um, this month, one thing that was very strong is that he really believed that we have a, understand that every single month there's an avodah that we have to do in the month. And it's not by chance that he passed away in the month of a, a, of a smell. And I was learning last night from a, from a Shlomo, and he says, you know, what is it about smell that's different than anything else? He says, you can see a piece of meat. It looks like a piece of meat. It is a piece of meat. But only when you smell it do you realize how dead it is. Mm -hmm. And he said an amazing sentence there that I think if we just think of this one sentence, it's enough. It's so profound because it's the shift that I think he came into and tried to change. He says, where does the, the, the smell of Gan Eden come from? Right? We know that we have this example with Yaakov and Esav, that they're wearing, right? that Yaakov puts on the clothing, and uh, a, when he comes into his father, yeah. to Yitzhak, he says, that he comes to Esav and uh, to 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 Yitzchak and Yitzchak says, "Look, this is the um, he, he smells the clothing, and um, he says this is the smell of the clothing is the clothing of the field that Hashem has blessed, and even Rashi who always keeps to the pshat has nothing to say but to explain, and he says Rashi there says Chakal Tapuchin Kadishin." bringing the Kabbalistic term for Gan Eden. This is the smell of Gan Eden. So if Rashi says it, then it has to be the Pshat, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a few things to think about in the story itself in the, at the level of Pshat is, where did he take, Yaakov takes the clothing from whom? Takes the clothing from Esav. Yitzchak smells Esav's clothing and he's smelling Gan Eden, something, right? We would think the opposite. So there's something beyond what is right and wrong. And Rav Shlomo says that, going back to the sentence, he says, when we talk about smell, good smell does not come from good actions alone. You can do everything right in your life and you will not have the Reach Gan Eden, he says. And you can do everything wrong in your life and you will have it. I think just that sentence itself flips over everything, the whole world of Torah and Halakha that he was used to. And, and I told Judy a story before, but now I think within this context, um, the, the, the light within the tragedy, like we were saying before, I heard a personal story in, of one of, the, one of the girls 
was massacred at the music festival. Um, and um, she came from a religious family and on the level, like your Sean would say, on the level of right and wrong. So what she what, what was she doing there on Simchat Torah, on Shabbat of all days, dancing disco music or, you know, but what, what was she doing? She was dancing on Simchat Torah, right? But we, there's a very special halacha that, you know, when someone passes away, we have something called taharain, which we purify the body to be at the level of the nefesh, to be at the level of the soul, in order to for the nefesh to be released and to be able to go up to the upper world. So it's like giving the body a final mikvah before the body goes up. There's a special halacha that anyone who dies al kiddush Hashem, we don't do tahara for them. No. Not only do we not do tahara, we also leave them in the very clothing that they that they died in al kiddush Hashem. And the father said, he said, you know how many fights I had with my daughter over her dress, of how she was dressing, going to these parties. Look at what I've learned. Her clothing was kadosh, was good enough for Hashem as she is. And I think that message is this message of reach, of what is beauty and what is not, is not only what we do and what we don't. It's something much deeper than that. And it's the, it's, it's the ability to have that vision with every single person that you meet in your life. The Shlomo says that he quotes um, Rabbi Nathan, who quotes Rabbi Nachman, that there's three levels. There's the level of emet, emet la mito, and shalom. There's the level of truth, the truth of the truth, and then the third level is shalom. Emet is a simple level. You see someone, he stole the apple. You know that he stole the apple. The second level, emet la mito, I'm quoting of Shlomo, is that you see how hungry he was, so he really needed that apple. And on the third level, he didn't take anything. All he did was eat an apple. In other words, the level of shalom is, is the highest level in which you're not naive to the world itself. You're able to go beyond that to the level of the tikkun, of where that person's innermost actions are coming from. So many times when someone does something, he doesn't mean to do wrong. And we're putting him in that space just by judging him and said he was stealing the apple because he was hungry. No, he wasn't even there. He wasn't even stealing. So, within, I think, the, the world that we're in now with everything upside down and everything shifting and everything difficult, the one thing that we could do is take that level and try to implement it with every single person that we meet and try to have, you know, a good nose. That's what this month is about, to have a good nose. And if your nose, you know, you can smell something from afar and you should be able to, if we really clean our senses, we should be able to smell someone from afar and, and find out where their sense of Gan Eden is. We should be able to be able to see that in every person that we see. I would say again, not so long ago, we had lost our smell completely. Everyone was just looking with their eyes at each other. And with your eyes, you can also look with beautiful eyes, but you can look with very judgmental eyes. I remember not so long ago, it's like we live in two worlds, the world before and the world after. But at the Simchat Beit Shreva, during Right, Sukkot, which was the world before, I was there, and I just mentioned something to someone, and he gave me that look, oh, so you're on the other side. And we were just, it was just like, I mentioned, you know, something, and the person was, we're in such a state of being defensive of what we believed was true, that if I said something that seemed to be that I was supporting or not supporting the judicial reform, who even remembers those words now, right? Then I'm on the wrong side and I don't have a schut kiyum. I don't, I, I, I don't have a right to exist within this person's Dalet Amot. 
That's where we were just a second ago. And now the same people who are organizing the Afghanot are using the same, right, everything that they prepared themselves for the Afghanot in order to really be out there and helping in every way possible. So in that sense, maybe, right, in that sense of the, the sense of the Reach, maybe something good has happened, that we've gone beyond the vision to a place in which we can actually come back as a people. And also to be, you know, to be able to keep the two worlds together, the brokenness and the simcha at the same time. I had a feeling for a long time with Shlomo's Nigunim that everyone wanted to go directly into the simcha. You skip the skate stage of going there, but Shlomo said, every Nigun that, that came down to me came down with six million broken cords. So maybe now we have a chance to sing the Nigunim properly with the broken cords, because we all are broken cords right now. And that when I was just at the Kever now, and it was so beautiful that we're able to sing a Nigun properly. I missed it. That we could sit and sing. You know, if Shlomo said, I used to, when I when I used to sing Esa Enai, I would sing it for half an hour. And now after five minutes, I've been once the next song. Then a, a few years ago, not so 15 years ago, I was saying, Halibai, we should have five minutes. It's like after 30 seconds, right, people want the next one. So it's something also that is beautiful coming out of this, so we can go back. That's where we are. We're in a place of brokenness, so we can go back to Nigunim as they were composed, as they came down to Shlomo, and really sing them. And through that, come to the simcha of the Nigunim as well. And through that, come to the simcha of, of, of being able to know that we're broken, but know that we're able to be the simcha as well. So I, I really, you know, I'm sure that Rav Shlomo is giving us all koach on this day to, to bring, you know, to continue that derech. I don't think he was naive. He knew that the world was broken, but he also found a way within the broken world to bring two things, to bring simcha in the broken world, but also bring a, a, a deep yearning for the geula, for, for redemption, for something different, that it can't go on like this. It can't. We can't go on. That's a statement from all levels of Amisa now saying, this can no, this cannot go on like this. And like if Simcha was saying before, maybe in a beautiful way, something beautiful will come in a way that we can never imagine. At the same time as we need to have the Gvura now that we need to have, maybe a big chesed will come out of that. And some people on the other side will say, it can't go on like this. Look how beautiful Amisal are. What's we, once you know the Rishaim are taken care of, maybe the people themselves will open up. I had a conversation today with a, a Muslim leader in Stockholm in Sweden. And he says to me, where are you now? I said to him, I'm, I'm in Yerushalayim. He says, he said, and I quote, he says, but Yerushalayim cannot have rockets fired over it. Yerushalayim has to be the source of mm -hmm. peace for the world. It can't be any other way. How do people not understand this? He's yelling at me from Stockholm. How do people not understand that Yerushalayim has to be the center of Shalom? He said that? Yes, for everyone. So, so maybe some, you know, something is happening without being naive and without and having the gvura that we need also to believe in the ultimate chesed that will come out of this. Thank you so much. Thank you. He says, uh, basically, he says, you're like, you're like Meir Kahana, right? <laughs> and Kobo says, basically, you yeah, have but there's a difference. He says, Meir Kahana's slogan was never again. And my, Shlomo says, my slogan is like never before. That's how I'm going.
Okay, so is there anyone in the room that wants to speak more? No, anyone um anyone in Zoomland wants to share something? Uh you wanna unmute yourself, let us know. No, hold up, there's a chat here. I don't see. Okay. Um uh, somebody wrote here in the chat, I'll just read it out loud. Moshe Stepansky. Do you know what a Jew is all about? A Jew keeps on doing what he's doing. Let's keep on doing what we're doing, spreading Shlomo's light and our own light, reflecting God's light in this world. Or as Shlomo says, just do it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we can stay and we can sing and we can... Uh... Oh, great. Great, great, great. Hold on, let me... Let me uh... I'm going to have to leave that one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very good. All right. Yeah, that was great. Okay. Pleasure to see you. Okay. So, holy, holy brother Mikhail, go on, love Somebody wants that. You know, Shlomo was always always saying that I'll, I'll be your friend. I remember the first time I saw Shlomo, he was doing a um a radio show on WBAI in uh, the fall of '73, and I remember Shlomo saying. Hebra, if you want to get started, straight out of the street, you need a you need a rav and you need a friend. That's almost as I'll be your friend. So <clears throat> many years later, I guess, Mikhail told me that once he said to Shlomo, he said, Shlomo, I don't want to be, I don't want to be your friend. I want you to be my Rebbe. I want you to be my Rebbe. And Shlomo says, You can't be my Rebbe. I I can't, you can't be my chos. I'm not your Rebbe. He says, Why can't I? I want you to be my Rebbe. And Shlomo says, you can't mm -hmm. be my Rebbe. I can't be. I can't be I, 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 Please feel free. Please correct me. Okay. Shlomo said, I can't be your Rebbe. <clears throat> I can't be a Rebbe because you don't know where I'm going. And then Mikhail says, I don't care where you're going. And then Shlomo says, you can't be my Rebbe. I can't be your Rebbe. I thought, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's always so good. <laughs> Um, I can't be a Rebbe because you you can't do what I'm doing. So he says two things. He says, number one, you don't know where I'm going. And <clears throat> you can't do what I'm doing. So what's Shlomo doing? Shlomo, as a, like, like uh, uh, Simcha said, Shlomo's saying hello. He's going out to the Riverside Park at two in the morning, holding the homeless, going, sitting by the, the, the cartons in the park. Holding their hands, singing songs, giving me all this money away. Mamish, you know, the first York site, I think I was by the shul, and the Shomla told us this story. She said, once on the Yom Tov, must have been maybe in Sukhas, Cholmud Sukhas, something like that. Or oh, it must have been a Yom Tov. <clears throat> anyway, they're walking after a Suda, on, they're walking up Broadway, and then and, and in those days, the, um, the homeless situation was unbelievable. And they're walking by the family, and it's cold. And there's a homeless guy sitting in his like his undershirt on. He has got no coat, shivering in a store in the storefront. And they're walking by, and Shlomo's, and Shlomo says, his father stops. He says, "What's wrong with me?" He takes off his beautiful new winter coat, 
wraps the guy up with it, and then he goes back home and fills up bags of food to bring to the guy. That's that was typical Shlomo, mm-hmm. right? But then, and there's so much more than that too. So anyway, <clears throat> what did Shlomo do? He saw that the only way he could make it being a successful shliach on Chabad wasn't working. They want, obviously you have to do it al Halacha, give a concert. There's 200 people there, boys on the right side, girls on the left side, half leaf. Boys can sing, girls can sing half from leaf. Boys can dance, girls can da-da-da. Someone says, by the time he does al Halacha, <laughs> he's got two idiots, right? So he explained it. He went to Rebbe. He says, listen, I says, got to lower the bar. And the Rebbe said, not in my name. So he started doing his own thing. And he was vilified for this. Because the is that he didn't do things just like a surgeon on Shabbos. Rebbe, Rebbe uh, surgeon is going to make a heart, over heart operation on Shabbos. Right? And it's almost saying, you know, we got to having a major heart attack here right now. We know for a fact. 90% of Yidin Amamish don't even want to know about it. These are the sweetest, highest Yidin that we don't even know. And Shlomo was lowering the bar. So that's one thing. And he took tremendous flack for it. So anyway, maybe 10 years or less years ago, I'm walking down the street and someone I don't remember came up to me and says, I got a story for you. And I don't remember who the guy was. I don't was. remember who the guy was. That's right. That's right. So that's, there's a, doesn't go further. Can I go on. That's a nice talk. I don't see where it's coming from, but it's, it's not this. I mean, it's also a part. Ah. Okay. I thought it was, oh, I'm not even YouTubing that. I thought it was going to be, okay. Good. Whoa. Thanks very much. Okay. So here's, here's the story. So the guy says um, there was a Rosh Yeshiva in Yerushalayim that for years was cocking Shlomo and putting him down and vilifying him, saying more terrible things about him. And then uh, all of a sudden, he gets in front of the whole base of Medrash and says, Kavra, you know, you know, Kavosai, you know, I've been tell- saying terrible things about Rabbi Shlomo for, for years and years. So I just want to say publicly, I'm asking Mechila, and I was totally wrong about Rabbi Shlomo. <laughs> so I have the, the Talmudim say, well, Rabbi, what happened? What happened? He says, last night I had a dream. And in my dream, I went upstairs to Shmuel's Chechel in Shemayim, and he's sitting in this huge room. And the whole room is, he's almost sitting in the middle of a beautiful chair throne room. And the whole room is filled up to the, to the, to the maybe the seat of the chair from the floor up with gigantic swarm, like big old, like, you know, more swarm, right? And he goes up to Shlomo, and the room is filled with these, right? And <laughs> And and the Rav says, Shlomo, what are these? What are these form? I mean, they're on the floor. What are these form? And Shlomo says, in these form are the names of all the people I'm a car. So he recovered the car of me. And uh, my children, my children's mother. And my grandchildren, he's got us all on the list. And he's got thousands and thousands. I'm just going to, right now, it's the last thing that I think it was the Friedrich Rebbe of, of um, Amshinov. His chassidim was saying, Rebbe, how could you hang out with Shlomo Karibai? And he said, everything he does is out of Ahavas Yisrael. Good Shabbos. Thank you, Shlomo. Thank you all for joining. I think we're going to stop the Zoom now.
Yehi zichro baruch. Let's continue the legacy with our pastor's term and bring Mashiach and the Gula to our actions. <laughs>